she ran in the barrel races ye yesterday, and so did uh, Krista over here, and uh, the qualifying, for at least locally, for those for the rodeo, but there was like 78 riders, I believe, and the barrel racers, and I talked about, how'd you do? Yeah. She said, I finished the course, not so well. That was her response, and I said to her, because I know her, I've noticed that she's a little quite young, I said, put it behind you, there's always the future. You know, you learn from the past, don't we? Don't we learn? But we move for the future, for the glory of God. And that's what God wants us to do. And so guess what? I told her, I said, you know what? Might not have been your best run. No barrels were down. That's good. You didn't get penalty points. Maybe not been the time you wanted, but the fact is it doesn't matter. But at the same time, I'm thinking here, because I know Krista, what she did, out of 78, she took seventh. The fact is, was it one spot out of the money? Well, so much. The fact is, you just had to keep even more feet to that horse to keep her running faster. But the bottom line is this. There's always tomorrow. With Jesus, guess what? We have him today and tomorrow. Amen? And we praise the Lord for that. Sue, it's good to see you this morning. Sue has been through a little bit, not as much as she thought she was going to be this week. But uh, there are other things to be concerned about. We just need to be praying for our people as we come before the Lord because we don't know what the future holds. Yeah, we do because Jesus tells us what the future is. But maybe for us personally, we don't always know what's going to be. Because I know some of you are going through some things. You know, I'm just going to say, pray for Dan this week. There's some things that are concerned for Sue and other things of tests this week and other things going on. And also, too, I'm not here to point her out, but the fact is uh, one of my friends that I've known since kid, childhood days, and uh, John Bishop died this week, and uh, Liz is part of our church. And uh, we want to hold them in prayer as a family as well before the Lord and uh, just be there to strengthen them and let the Holy Spirit guide and direct. But that's what communion is all about as we share together in the journey. Amen? And that's what God wants us to do together. So as our brothers come, as they will get the elements ready, if you two will come and get ready. As we practice here, if you're new to New Trail, we're glad you're here. Welcome. This is how we, how we share together. And that is that uh, it's kind of been a tradition here. We started the fact is people just like to come and take the elements back to their place and then share it there together. And so as they do, as you come in just a moment, I'll pray over the elements in just a moment. But as you come and just take them with you, and then I, I will pray, and then you just take it in the time you will see fit between you and the Lord. But remembering what Jesus has done in the past, so you can live with a relationship with him for today, and know there will be a fraternal res residency with him, and walk with him in the future. Isn't that wonderful? Let's pray together. Lord, it is now, this is your elements they're your, your bread, the, the crackers that represent your broken body, the bro juice that represents your bro the, the shed blood of, the, of your son Jesus on the cross. We thank you for today. We thank you for what was done in the past, what is now it means for the present, and what it will mean for the future. Lord, we thank you so much. Let's remember what the atonement of Jesus, that sacrifice of his blood on the cross for us, to wash us free from our sin is all about. May we not be just doing the church thing today. Let's be in a relationship with you. And may the Holy Spirit guide and direct us and lead us into the presence of yourself. May as we come and share the elements, may they be doing so. Because remember, it was done for the broken body that you identify with us. And the blood that was shed to be our washing of our sins. Free of ourselves and of sin that would want to reign in our lives. And we have victory in Jesus. We thank you for them today. We remember them now. And may the Lord you bless this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you feel led, just come and take the elements and take them back to your seat and share there.
take each part as you feel led. If you've already taken, fine. If not, just let the Lord speak to you as you take the elements together. Lord, thank you for what you've done for us. Because if it were for you, we'd have no hope. In Jesus' name we pray and God's people said. Amen. 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 Well, if you have your Bibles, there'll be a couple, three passages of Scripture we'll be looking at. But the one I'm starting with this morning is John 19, verse 11. Interesting week, America. Now hear this, hear me clearly. And before I speak, I better say the fact is, do not get after me today because as soon as I say amen here, I must go because I'm with my mother uh, actually wants to go to something of a family event. It probably might be the last time she ever does it. So I'm taking my mother. And so as soon as I'm done here, my wife and my son are staying here to be part of the dinner with you. I would love to be, but we're going to this event that really... Uh, honor somebody that is very, she's very close to. And if my mom wants to go out, we're going. <laughs> at at 90 and a half, almost 91 years old and with her health failing, we need to uh, do that. So do not take it personally. I'm leaving immediately, okay? And to be part of that and pick her up and go to the event. So I want to know that. But anyway, this week has been interesting. And hear me, they, I'm going to put a precursor here. Folks, I think what's happened in the church, the church has become a political tool rather than a place of God's redemptive work. Now, as a church, we, speak, we do speak. We do have influence politically. We should be people that, that vote. We should be people that speak about things that affect the moral character of man. I have a problem when we let legislation try to dictate moral character. The church is to be the salt and light. Now, I'm not saying the fact is I don't want to protect children when it comes to abortion. I do. Sad that we have to try to get laws, and now we see laws are changing to where now children are no longer protected, even after they're born, in at least three states now. But my point is this. This last week has been interesting. I'm not here to say I'm for Trump or for Biden. I'm not too happy with either of them, to be honest with you. I'm just going to be blunt. Can I just say that? I'm just not too happy. Bottom line is this, John Calvin, the famous reformer, said he was credited with this statement. And he said this, when God wants to judge a nation, he gives them wicked leaders. You listen to that? When God wants to judge a nation, he gives them wicked leaders. Let's face it. You look what happened to Germany, what kind of leader did they have? He judged them. You look at Uganda, some of you don't even remember who Idi Amin was, some of you do. God judged that nation. Turns out, though, God did. There was such a change in God in that culture that there was such leadership change in the sense of spiritually, the people gave themselves to Jesus Christ that they soon had a president after Idi Amin and others that that country for several, for about a decade, was one of the most prosperous countries in all of Africa. Because all their leaders were men that, or women that followed Jesus Christ. And they lived by biblical principles. Now they've since, people elected them out or they moved on and it's changed. But there was judgment that came upon that country. Israel, by the way, when you look in the Old Testament, time and time again, Israel got judged by God, and guess what? Usually it's because of the king that led him to the, I call the primrose path of destruction. Let's face it. Jeroboam, Rehoboam, which were kings of the northern and southern kingdoms, when they were divided, both of them were ungodly men. Rehoboam went away from his father Solomon and did a, unrighteous things. You see them eventually killing children called the, to the god Moloch. These were already born children, by the way. 
They killed him for sacrifice to hope and appease the God that they were now following. Folks, we got the same problem in America. We got the same thing going in America. And the thing about it is, God judges a nation that's going to turn its back on biblical leadership. I want you to know, America has never been perfect. But you look at our early American fathers, you know what their desire was? They really wanted to see a second Israel. They wanted to see God working in the in country. And we see that. And, if, and folks... We're so skewed in our history teaching. The fact is we don't even know what history is anymore. Our kids don't even understand history of what American history is. Listen to David Barton with Wall Builders. Just turn him on. Listen to him at 530 on, on Bot Radio. I mean, let's face it, folks. This man has the most documents of the early American fathers of any man who's living in the United States. He has 70-some thousand copies, whether it's parchments or books of our early American fathers. What they wrote and what they believed. We have people who say, well, they were deists, which means they believed in God, but then God disappeared and just kind of left things going. There were a few like that, like Ben Franklin and a few others. But most of them had relationships with Jesus Christ. Benjamin Rush, one of the Signers Declaration of Independence, wrote a book called about civil, liber- uh, civil government. He uses 1,500 references of Scripture designing the legislative, the executive, and the judicial branch of the United States based from Scripture. They meant to follow the pattern of God, what God wanted. And God blessed. Was there imperfection? Because we didn't practice everything equitably. Let's face it, we still had slavery until the Civil War. We had a lot of other issues going on. But God was also allowing some things to happen. The fact is that that we found ourselves being judged accordingly. But through that, God began to do a great work of revival. You say, well, what does God have to do about bringing up wicked leaders? What does God have his hand in? Well, in John chapter 19, verse 11, we see that Jesus is before Pilate. You with me? And he speaks to him because Pilate is trying to work through the situation because he wants to wash his hands of the guilt of, about sacrificing Jesus on the cross and so on. But right, chapter 9, verse 11 says this, 19, I should say, 11 says, Jesus answered, Pilate, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from where? Above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. In other words, the Jews, the Pharisees, they were, they were guilty of a greater sin. But the thing about it is, he said, the only reason you've got power is who gives it to you. Now, in America, we are so arrogant to think that we're the ones who put somebody into power. You know what? God moves upon the hearts of every person. Now, I want to tell you something. We might not like how things went. You people, I'll tell you what, America the last eight years has gone banana nuts. Would you agree? We have gone banana nuts in America. (coughs) You say, what's banana nuts? Well, you figure that out. But get this. Look what happened the night, and like I said, I'm not saying right or wrong. The night that President Trump became president or was elected president, we saw like an outpouring of anguish like we've never seen. Then we go four years later, and it's still debated how much were the boxes jammed by false ballots. I can tell you my opinion, but my opinion is just that. It's opinion. We're not here to teach opinions. We're here to teach God's word. But we've got to be careful because what's happened is we've let opinions dictate our spirit in the church, and I'm afraid the church has been more opinionated than prayerful. Does that make sense? The church has been more opinionated than prayerful. We're called to be a people after God's heart because we're called people that says, God, we've got a problem in America. We all have to look at our own hearts, don't we? But we as a church, thank you, Terry. I was lacking my water. Thank you, brother. Terry's on top of the ball all the time, even if I give him a hard time. I'll be nice to you, Terry, once. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. But what was happening is the fact is God did not call us to be a church that was opinionated, we're called to be a people of prayer. But we've got to look at something here. If if John Calvin is right when he says when God judges the nations, he gives them un, or he gives them wicked leaders, what have we become to today? 
let's face it, we have now become a country that does not matter what the law or constitution says. We will do what we think we want to do as we have been watching what's happening in our government. Now, whether you want to debate the issue of what happened this week, whether Mr. Trump had hush money and all those things, I'm not about to go there. Because I'll guarantee you, I think there's things that we have no idea and I don't want to know because I'm not that I want to be an ostrich in the sand. But I'll tell you what, I think we would find our spirits greatly defeated if we allow ourselves to dwell on what man is doing wickedly. Now, you know, you see things that came across your Facebook, and I'm sure the fact that I saw one that says the new 12 millionaires in America, referring to the 12 jurors. Could be, could not be. I don't know. But I want to tell you something. We are at a crossroads like we have never been before because we are judge a country that is now under the judgment of God. If you think we can just keep getting by on what we once were, forget it, because God still looks what's going on today. We're called to be a people to seek after God. But he's looking at America, and he's looking at America saying, we went, we're thumbing God in the face. We've done it starting in 1963 when we turned our back on prayer in school and everything else. What we have done ever since then is become a people, a defiant to the very clarity of God's direction and judgment. What's judgment going to look like? Well, let me just look at things. Let's just see how, what happens when we become people that are not obedient to God. You have your Bibles. Turn to the little book of Amos in the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets. Sometimes it's hard to find because even though I have to go along and say, let's see, let me hope. I have to review it again. Micah, Amos, Nahum, Habakkuk, all those. I have to keep going backwards and backwards and figure, until I find it because uh, it's, I know the books, but they, sometimes I get lost. Chapter 2. We're going to be looking through verses 4 through 16, but I'll just highlight the verses. Chapter 2, verse 4 says, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not relent, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees, because they have been led, been led astray by false gods, the gods their ancestors followed. Number one, what's one of the things we see that we're getting God's judgment? Number one, the rejection of the law of the Lord. And not keeping his statutes. In other words, we're not going to keep the laws. Let's face it. We're familiar with ten what? Commandments. Those are laws. Do you realize the laws of our land that we have in the United States are based off of ten commandments? There's two commandments, really, when you look at the New Testament. Because the, t- the summation of five of the ten are made in two by Jesus. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and spirit, and mind. And then, love your neighbor as yourself. You look at your ten commandments, the first five are having about loving the Lord your God. The last five are how you relate to each other. So we see here, the fact is we see that why do we see God's judgment comes? Because we have rejected the law of the Lord. Because I'll tell you what, we want to be sure that we're thoughtful to everybody. I'm going to say something. America said in the beauty of Christian faith and the truth of, of our founding fathers, guess what? They believed to let people have the freedom to worship but they understood what we were about, and that is we are people following the Lord himself. So when you come to America, when you're supposed to come, you came with understanding this is where they're at. You can worship, but the fact is your religion is not going to dictate over what we have started. Let's face it. You go to somebody's house. You go in there. You don't go around remaking the house when you show up in the first 10 minutes of the house, do you? What would you have a problem with if he did? I mean, let's face it. Well, you know, I think this picture here would look better over here. And you move the picture over there. And the hostess walks into the room and goes, something's not right in this room. And then the person that stepped back out and you change something else. And pretty soon the couch is in the middle of the room instead of on the wall where it was at or whatever else. You would have a problem, wouldn't you? You came to that house with the conditions are that the fact is I'm coming as a guest and understanding the guidelines of the home, and they said, your home, our home is yours. I've traveled a lot. I've been in a lot of homes when I've been on church business. And what's interesting is when you get into the homes, you know, they say, here's the refrigerator. Here's what all you want. They gave you kind of car blanc. I love that. But they didn't ask me to sleep in the bedroom with them. They did not ask me to change the furniture as you see fit. No. I understood the guidelines ahead of time, didn't I? But I'm welcome in their home, and I have freedom in their home. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? And that's what he did. When people come to America, you should come with understanding. When you come with understanding, this is the rules and guidelines. Our Father said we want to be a country that follows after God. 
But what's happened is we as a people in the country have now become very fat, sassy cats. And I say that right, I say it purposely. We become fat, sassy cats. How we become fat is because we have become very affluent and we enjoy what we have, don't we? I love watching I believe buy, sell, or trade or anybody else's. It's amazing what, amazing what people are selling. I don't know why they're selling them. They're selling them for great prices depending on what it is. Might be a mobile home, might be a trailer, might be a boat, it might be whatever. All those things. I always wonder what the reason they're selling it. I always kind of makes me wonder is that just they don't have use for it or they just need the money. But the bottom I see is the fact is that as I look at those guidelines and see that what they want to do, to me it always goes back to what was selfishly they wanted. Suddenly I don't have need of it. I was talking to somebody here in the last hours and it was interesting the fact is they said oh and they were talking about their family member their grandmother's house the fact is they're going to have to move so much and it's just things and stuff boy how many of us have dealt with people's our parents or grandparents as a stuff and I want to ask you how many of your kids are going to go going mom and dad get so much stuff but the bottom line is this it's amazing how we focus so much on things we forgot and we turn because we liked what we had. We forgot what we were supposed to do and that was walk in the laws of the Lord. So why is America about to be judged and why is it coming under judgment? Because we have been rejecting Jesus Christ. Let's face it, folks. We have been rejecting and let's just look at the church. The church has rejected Jesus Christ. Let's just say it. The church has rejected Jesus Christ. He said, no, we don't. We still worship here. I want to tell you something. Somebody in class said to say, what are you, they were saying, what are you here in church for today? Are you here just to do a duty or are you here to worship the Lord? If you're here on duty, time to get the heart right because I'll tell you what, God will say to you, I didn't know you. I didn't know you. Because we have rejected the call of obedience to God's guidance in our personal life. We all have to look at that. Myself, any of you. We have to look at our hearts and say, where's my heart in this whole thing? Whatever it might be, am I rejecting what God's wanting to do? But the fact is, hmm. As we look here in chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, I want to read on for you here. Will you follow with me? This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor and as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lay, aside, they, they lay down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God they drink wine taken as fines. Ooh, this is a loaded statement here. I want to tell you something. You remember we were talking about when Jesus was sacrificed on the cross. What did those soldiers do with his cloak? Remember? Cast lots. Thank you. Do you realize what that was for? Do you realize how a, cl a, 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 a cloth or the, the cloak was meant as a part of a loan transaction as a security? Did you know that? What's happening, he's saying here, the fact is you as a people, as he says, you have violated even Israel's laws. The fact is, see, every culture does things differently, don't they? But there was violation of Israel's laws here because we see that they did things and did it for their own purposes. They even drank wine because we read verse 12. But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. You say, what does that mean? It means this. We had people drinking and enjoying at the pleasure of somebody else's commitment of trust. And it was because they had dis disobeyed the law of Israel. This folks, folks, we have laws, and the United States is the most lawed country in the world. Did you know that? We have more laws than any other country in the world. We also have more prisons than anybody else in the world. Do we have a problem in America, you think? <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what. I know there was a big debate about whether we add on to our jail or, or, or to our courthouse, and all that happened there. And we can debate the issue about our dollars going to that. Want you to know something? We bragged about it because now we could be a regional, you know, now Slant has outdone us by how many million dollars. 
and now and have the jail there to, for people to stay in. The fact is so we can help other areas where the crime is out of control. Well, I'll tell you why. Because they're violating not only God's law, but they're violating the laws of the land that we have give, been given by the Holy Spirit. Oh. So we see that God has got some things. There was trust established. And what has happened is these people that were making profit, because are we finding a problem today that... People are getting profit at the expense of other people. Where does it say a father and son use the same girl? You know what that's talking about? Yeah, let's just call it fornication. You know, it wasn't that many long ago, and we still got people trying to hide themselves from a certain man who hung himself in a jail cell in New York City because he had an island where he had young girls to where people of well renown were knowing to visit, known to visit. It's amazing how many of them have tried to keep a distance, but some don't care. In other words, they're using people in such a way to their own pleasure, to their destruction, to their young people's destruction, and themselves thinking they're above the law. Now, whatever you thought of what happened this last week in the trial, The bottom line is this, we have been hearing the hue and cry of the unrighteous because of something that didn't go their way. That's what's happened. Because they're willing to break laws themselves, and it might be that Mr. Trump did break laws. I'm not here to say he did or didn't. I'll do what the jury says, the fact is. But there's all these things that have been going on in our country today that have been pointing to the fact is that we are defying both God's law and the laws that man has put into place. We see Israel did it because that's why we're reading in Amos that very thing. But there's also something else. Verse 9 and 11, we read these. Yet I destroyed, this is chapter 2 of Amos, yet I destroyed the Amorites before them, though they were, all, they were tall as the cedars and strong as the oaks. I destroyed their fruit above, the, above and their roots below. I brought you up out of Egypt and led you 40 years in the de- wilderness to give you the land of the Amorites. I also raised up the prophets from among your children and Nazarites from among your youths. Is this not true, people of Israel, declares the Lord? Here's the third thing we do. Even because of the abundance and goodness of God, that God has done and taken action on our behalf, the people, and we as a people, have turned our backs on God and putting ourselves in a position to be judged. Let's just face it, folks, we are. Hmm. Boy, you look at our history and we look at what's happening now. We have issues going on all over the place that brings God's judgment. If you looked at the seven seven of the sins of Israel when they were listed through Scripture, you had things such as deportation, slave trade. You had acts of wrath. You had exporting one's, uh, 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 taking territory from somebody else. One of the phrases in Scripture uses ripping open pregnant women. And desecrating corpses. Those are some of the sins that Israel did. And you wonder why God judged them? (laughs) They're violating the very thing that God called sacred. You say a corpse is a corpse. I will tell you what. The corpse was meant to be taken care of because in the Israel mind, the fact is, is this. That was still represented the house that was supposed to hold that of God himself. Oh, we can read in Leviticus 18 and following, 7 and following there, if we were to go there, we can read of the mistreatment of the poor, the sexual immorality. Is that going on in America? Let me ask you folks, let me just put another little, let me just get down to earth. How many of you feel that you have less money today than you had a few years ago? Are you getting to the ranks of the poor? (laughs) You're feeling again there, aren't you? If you're not there, you're getting there. Let's face it. The one world government wants you to be poor, to be dependent upon them, no matter the cost of life to you. God's not going to judge America? Sure is. If he judged Israel, he judged Sodom and Gomorrah, he's going to judge us. 
Oh, the sexual immorality. It's rampant. I mean, let's face it. As I already said before in the pulpit, what do you got right here? We don't need TV. We don't need computers. It's in your hand. We're suffering because of our own desecration of our, ourselves, of morally decay, decaying because of our sexual immorality. The other thing I'm going to talk about a little bit here is the fact is how we find injustices in the court and the, just the whole system of those who claim to have authority. Now, I heard there's a change of heart, but how many heard this past week of a young man in Kentucky who had the right to say he gives praise to his glory and glory to his heavenly Lord Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. But he took it just a little liberty be off script and what did the school say? He's not getting his diploma. Now I've read since that there was a rescinding of that and they've given it to him. But I'll tell you what, what gives the right for a man if we're in a country that we claim we can declare our liberties? Whether we agree with them or not. Brother Dan over here can give an opinion. I might not agree with it. <laughs> but guess what? He's still my brother. I don't have to always agree, but the bottom line is this. We have been given a right in America to be able to speak freely, have we not? I mean, we kid, Terry and I, we kid. We, 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 we've knocked horns at times. We sure have, but we're still brothers. We have opinions, don't we? But the bottom line is this. By the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, guess what? We have been given by the work of the early American fathers the right to speak those opinions. But now when we say, ha, you cannot speak, and therefore the other side can speak and not get punished, but you will get punished for speaking righteously. Do you think God's going to put up with that? No. God's judgment is here. You see, what will the evidence of God's judgment be? Number one, death. People will die. For standing for righteousness, and he will bring death in a great way. And yes, it'll come upon the righteous and unrighteous. Because we bear the brunt of it. And you say, well, why should the church suffer? Because the church has not been the salt and light that God called it to be. Come on, we talk about salt and light. Salt what? Preserves. Light exposes. We're called to expose sin, but we're also called to preserve and to, I call agitate. Because what does salt do to a wound? It agitates, but it also helps preserve and heal. So I share this to say, okay, first of all will be death. But you say, are there things before death? I gave the ultimate first. There will be suffering and pain of agony. You can debate the timing of when Jesus is going to show up. But even before it shows up, as you look at some passage of Scripture, there will be suffering where we will not have a means to hardly eat. And even the fact is, even before the full revelation of this mark of the beast, it will be hard for many people to get food and to be able to live accordingly. Why? Because that's what the Antichrist wants to do. He wants to control you and destroy you. You say, well, you're talking about God's judgment. Remember, God can't handle sin. He hates sin. And when we as a people have turned our way about laws, or turned away from his law of himself, we've turned away from the laws of the land that were, for us were established from the word of God, even though more have become more than they should be, I think. And thirdly, that when we've seen God's good, goodness and provincial blessing, we turn against it. And reject it? How can we expect any less than God's judgment? Now, folks, I want you to know I'm an encouraging pastor. I like to be encouraged. But we've got to deal with the reality of what we're dealing with in our culture today. And it's not just America. It's happening around the world. It's sad to see that the African Methodist Church is still holding to biblical principles. The American Methodist Church is abandoning all of Scripture. Just look at the last two weeks what's happened at their conference. 
They have approved all the things of, of anybody who is a, that holds to the agenda of sexual agenda of the LGBTQ. It's okay for them to be pastors. It's okay. No, it's not. Scripture says it's sin. Do we love those people? Sure we do. We better. Whatever you do. If any of you become like, uh, what's the church in Topeka? Oh, what's their names? You know who I'm talking about, folks. Phelps. If you become like that, we'll have a problem, folks. That is wrong. That's not expressing Jesus. I'll tell you what. My dad said, I really found out what they're like about Jesus. When they came to protest at the Messiah at Bethany College, mom and dad and my aunt were sitting there, and all of a sudden two cars, three cars pulled up. They suddenly jumped out, got their placards out of the trunk and everything else, and I guess they went to a prescribed spot, the spot they were allowed to protest from. What was interesting, dad said, my dad, being the person that he was, was a little ornery. He kind of got close to walking close to them, and they were shouting out their slogans. And, and he just looked at them, and he said, I found out something I didn't know I was. I said, oh, what was that, Dad? He said, well, I went, and I said to the one guy, what do you do with John 3.16? And the guy turned on him in the name of Jesus. Note this. I'm going to call it that. And he turned, and I quote, damn moron. My dad said, I didn't know I was a moron. <laughs> now, some of you knew my dad. Some of you knew him real well. You know that he found great delight in the fact is he stirred the pot a little bit. But he was pointing the fact is, what do you do with John 3.16? These people need Jesus Christ too, you know. You might be against their lifestyle, but they need Jesus. They need to be redeemed. They're to be loved, to be cared for. But the problem is the church failed to say this. It's still sin. It's still sin. And so this morning, as I'm speaking to the fact is of our call to be a people of righteousness, let's be careful that we don't go through the suffering because, which we're probably about to go through, because of a rejection of God's laws and rules. Secondly, the rules that God even established in the land and then rejecting the very benefits that God gave us, which we're still enjoying yet. Why do people still want to come to America? Because of what? Freedoms. They want to enjoy them. But we have become a people that have become such an adamant personalities of, of saying the fact is, I'll do it, as Frank Sinatra was saying, I'll do it my way. Folks, we're living on the edge. God's calling us to back, come back to righteousness, to holiness. That's what God wants us to do. May God help us be a people like that. Because I'll tell you what. I don't want to be a people that were already were so judged because of now almost 21 million babies that no longer exist since Roe versus Wade. We can discuss the issue of that. But the fact is, the Bible tells us that he hears the cry of the innocent. And he hears them. We live in tough days, folks. We do. It's not easy. God didn't say that we're called to live on a roller coaster ride just having a fun time. It's not going to be easy. Some of you might have watched. The fact is, it's, I think it's in Switzerland. It's one of these little car seats you sit in. There's a simple, simple rail. And you let off a brake, and it's like five or eight miles. I forgot how far it is. Down through the mountains of Switzerland. And they said there's ex unexpected turns, and you think you're ready, and you've got to be sure you have that brake. We never know how hard the ride's going to be, do we? But God calls to say, ride with me. I want you to know I'm going to show my victory, my power, my, my overcoming authority in who I am. But God's calling us, and I didn't even touch Ezekiel 7. Ezekiel 7, read it for yourself. It is a painful book, chapter to read. As we read through the judgment of God upon his people. And really it respect, reflects to what's going to happen to us. You say, can you give us an encouraging word? Yes. Let's be people of righteousness. 
of holiness, of pure purity of God. Seek him with your whole heart. Seek the Lord. I mean, folks, I want to get to enjoy some things with our grandkids this week, and especially watching one play baseball and never watched you play before. It'll be good. But I fear for the future of where my grandkids are going to have for America. If we don't get on our knees. Because I want you to know something. Let me give you one more encouraging word. God's word shows that when his people come broken and humble, God does hear. Think of Nineveh. What happened to Nineveh? They were to be destroyed. But God moved, didn't he? Because of Jonah. Folks, there's been things that have happened in the, through history that where people interceded and God made a chiver and God held off. How long will God hold off? I'm not here to make that judgment, am I? That's God's hand. My place is the fact is to live righteously before him. As much as I understand how to walk in that, but also to say, God, we've got to call sin for what sin is. We have to live in the righteousness of God's word. We've got to obey the word and let Christ be seen through it all. May God help us as a people, because as I'm looking at my own heart about some things, may God help us be each looking at our own hearts. As, as, as like a young man down here has got a heart attitude right now. He's going, I don't, I don't want to be, I'm squealing, I'm doing my thing. Let me have my own space because I want to go my place. Isn't that how we are as Americans? You know, we worry about the border. I worry about the border too. What we've let inside the borders of our heart. What have we allowed inside the borders of our heart? That have become things that have desecrated the power and the holiness of the Holy Spirit of God within us. Yeah, Liam, you're looking at me. You're happy because mom's lifting you up and down those legs. Yeah, you're smiling at me because you got your way, didn't you? Well, folks, let's be careful we're not the same way spiritually. We'll be sure we're following God's way. May God help us to be a people after the heart of God. God's judgment is coming. I'm praying we can hold it off by people being people of prayer Seeking the righteousness of God. You say, it won't, happen. it won't happen to America. I'll tell you something. You ever study the early church? You know how many cities are still existing that the early churches that we read about in Revelation and Acts? You know how many of those cities are existing? Or countries that as countries? Zero. If you think the United States can't disappear off the map, think twice. God's a God of justice. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and open up the blessings of heavens. Yes. Amen, sister. And, uh, and there is the final note. <laughs> Amen. We follow 2 Chronicles, Chronicles 7.14. Folks, may God help us to be a people of righteousness in a day that's so unrighteous, but we can see God. His judgment may be held off so that others might be walking in the righteousness of Christ. And we see a country that still is shining for Christ. That's what God wants us to be. Let's not be a people that are under the judgment of God. Lord, would you bless us this day as may we follow with you our whole spirit of God, what you're wanting to do amongst us and through us. Lord, we are a people most broken, most sinful. May we recognize that we have got to be a people after the heart of God. We love you and we praise you. And I pray, Lord, that you will speak to every heart in this room and those who've listened by online. Lord, may we just be a people that are just hungry to see the revelation of God, the Holy Spirit working in us because we're people broken before you. We understand your judgment because you can't put up with sin.
we know that people turn away from sin, your heart is softened and you show grace. May we be a people hungering for that grace because we pray and seek it. It's in your name we pray and we give you thanks for the glory of your power upon your spirit upon us now. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Folks, I love you. You're a great church. You'll excuse me if I depart quickly. Amen.